everyone even if you're watching this on YouTube now or in five years welcome to the lecture um, we're gonna talk about regression analysis um, so the way that I planned it is that first talking about regression in general and then showing you guys single linear regression um, things like how to compute confidence intervals and make some plots um, I wanted to say a couple of words about multiple linear regression and um, quadratic regression and then have words or have some slides about model selection because that's generally the hard part um, putting up the regression model is easy but then defining what is a good regression model and what's a bad one is, is definitely more and more difficult so what I wanted to stress is that you can ask any question that you want I've been doing linear modeling now for like almost 12 years um, I'm not an expert but I am kind of right that's just the point the more you know about a subject the more you know that you don't know right so but I, I've got a lot lot of experience about linear regression so in R you do it using the LM function and the ANOVA so I, today we are only going to talk about this little red part so general uh, general linear models we're not going to talk about how to deal with repeated measurements or mixed models where you have random effects and fixed effects um, we, I don't want to talk about generalized linear models where you have a response which is not a normal distribution like logistic regression when you're trying to define like a zero one output so kind of um, what you have in a case control study right so someone either gets better or dies right so if that is your response um, surviving or not surviving um, then you cannot use general linear models so general linear models are for variables which follow a Gaussian slash normal distribution. Um, so there's many different terms. So people, some people, people, uh, some people call it linear regression. Other people say analysis of variance. Other people call it analysis of covariance or multiple linear regression. All of these things are the same thing in my mind, and I'm trying to. I hope that in this hour I can convince you guys that that's the case, right? So regression analysis is actually very basic. It is a statistical process for estimating the relationship among variables, right? So variables can be human height, called stature, um, and for example, your food intake. Um, but so anything that you can measure, if you're measuring multiple variables, you can more or less relate to each other. And regression analysis, the, the goal of it is to kind of find a model which estimates this relationship and which can be used, right? So which you can exploit in the future. And so if we know that people who are um, bigger, right, have more stature, um, are more likely to give money than when I'm a hobo and I'm begging for money on the street, I will not ask people who are small, but I would only ask people who are big, right? That's just the way that it works. If I know that people who look very rich give me more money, then I'm going to try and exploit that, right? So the regression analysis is a statistical process to estimate the relationship between two or more variables. And there are many, many techniques for, ever, uh, for analyzing several variable models. Right, regression is not the only technique. You could use correlation and all of these things, or uh, covariance, or whatever you want. Yeah, but in regression, the focus is on the relationship between a dependent variable and one or more independent variables. So the dependent variable is the thing that you are trying to model. So in our case when we look at the Berlin fat mouse the thing that we are trying to model is the fatness of the mouse so the amount of fat that it has the body weight that it has so these are our dependent variable so it's the output or the effect the thing that we are trying to estimate the independent variables are variables which are the input or the cause for example the food intake of the mouse uh, the amount of exercise that it gets and all of these things that we think might be causing the dependent variable causing or affecting the dependent variable right so if we if we would write this down into a mathematical sense then hey you would write down that y here is the dependent variable because we want to predict y and y is then given by some function of x and x is then the thing that we are measuring for example the food intake so is there a relationship a function that we can define which couples the food intake to the obese phenotype of a mouse 
right? It could be that we have a more complex function hey, where we have z being our um, dependent variable, so the thing that we want to predict. And now, of course, hey, we can have the food intake plus the amount of exercise. Is there a function when given a certain food intake, given a certain amount of exercise, can predict um, the dependent variable, so the body weight of the mouse? So in a regression model, this is the kind of standard regression model that everyone shows you. So y here is our dependent variable, the thing that we want to model, the thing that we want to predict, is around equal to some kind of a function of x, which are the independent variables, and then we have unknown parameters, right? So the betas are the, the estimates of the, the effect of these individual measurements. And this x is actually a matrix because it can be a single variable, but it could also be a hundred variables, right? So when you think about this in your mind, then regression is more or less a, a matrix um, where you have a vector of measurements, right? Imagine we have a hundred mice of which we measured the body weight and then we might have a matrix which is uh, two columns. The first column is the food intake, the second column is the exercise and then of course for every one of these hundred mice we have the measurement for this. Right, so in the end we have a vector, which is our y, our dependent variable. Then we have independent variables, which is a matrix of x. And then we have betas, because we want to estimate the effect, for example, that the food intake has on our dependent variable, which can be positive and which can be negative. So within this regression model, people never mention that there's actually two constants, which you don't see into the model, but n is the number of independent measurement. So if we have 100 mice, then n is 100. And then k, small k, is the number of unknown parameters. So in our case, that would be 2, right? Because we have the food intake and the exercise. So in regression, the power of a regression model um, when the assumptions are holding comes from uh, this. So when the n, so the number of independent observations that you have, is larger than the number of observ or the number of independent variables for which you want to estimate the beta, this is called the excess of information. So n minus k gives us how much information we have to base our predictions on. Of course, regression comes with a bunch of assumptions. And the ones highlighted in red are the ones which are mostly violated by people when they write scientific uh, publications. Right? So the first assumption is that the sample that we are looking at is representative of the population for the inferred prediction. Right? That means very basically that if I want to know something about humans and I'm doing regression models on, on humans to figure out something for what is generally true for the whole human population, I cannot limit myself to studying only uh, people from European descent, right? Because then the first assumption is broken because humans as a group do not consist of only European descent people. There's also people from Africa, there's people from Asia. And so there's a, the, 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 the sample that I'm taking needs to be representative. And this goes wrong 99% of the time. When you are looking at a paper and people are doing a association analysis, for example, in a hospital in Spain, then they always make it seem like their results can be generalized across the whole world. Right? So they have a drug, they want to look at the effect of the drug, they, they have five hospitals in Spain in which they give people the drug or they don't give people the drug, and then in the end they conclude, well, this drug works. But that is wrong, because they should have concluded that this drug works for people who live in Spain. So, first error that always goes wrong. The other one is that if you look at the error term, Right, so after we have done our model, right, so we have our observations that we are interested in modeling, we have our observations which we think predicts the, the thing that we want to model, and we have our beta variables. After we fit this, right, so after we fit the model, we are left with an error term, which is how good the prediction fits the real world observation. And the distribution of these errors should be a random bear uh, the, this, the, the distribution of this should be a normal distribution with a mean of zero 
no one ever checks this. I almost never see papers where people show the distribution of the error term. Not showing the distribution of the error term means that no one can estimate how valid your model is. The next one is the independent variables are measured with no error. And this is impossible. You cannot measure the food intake of a mouse without any error. There is always error. So had these ones are generally considered to be unfulfillable. It is an assumption, but this assumption is generally not true. The predictors are linearly independent. Um, so this means that the food intake and the exercise should not show any correlation. Right? If, if food intake is highly correlated with the exercise, I cannot estimate the effect of food intake on the body weight um, independent of the uh, exercise on, on, the, on the body weight. So for linear regression, when we start doing linear regression with more than one variable, the assumption is always is that these two variables that we're looking at are not correlated to each other, so that they are linearly independent. Um, the errors are uncorrelated, we will get back to that, um, and that, that's very similar to the variance of the data, should you blah blah, but Homer's class. So, but the ones in red are the ones that if you ever get asked to review a paper, because you're a master's student, so some of you will do a, a, a PhD at some point, if you are analyzing a paper where people do a regression model, make sure that the first, or the ones highlighted in red, really hold. And the first one is the one that goes wrong the most because people look at their favorite population, right? So they do something in um, Germany. Um, they have five participating hospitals in Germany and then they conclude that the drug works and it's all fine, but it's not true because when you are looking at hospitals in Germany, in the end, the population that is represented by your sample is not humans. It is Germans, which is a very distinct subset of the whole population. We already talked about the excess of information, which is one of these things that you also have to check. Make sure that when people have measured a hundred humans, that they are not estimating a hundred and one um, different parameters, right? So different observations. So instead of having uh, uh, exercise and uh, food intake, hey, you can only estimate a hundred. Well, not really a hundred because you have to have some access inf information. Just generally what we say is that when you have a hundred mice, you can fit the square root of a hundred of parameters, which means that if you have a hundred mice, you can kind of reliably estimate 10 of these effects, right? So you could estimate um, um, the, the exercise, you could estimate food intake, and then like eight other ones. But if you would then add another 10, then that is impossible because then you run out of, of degrees of freedom, so to speak. So in R, um, we do regression via the linear model function. So for this, I first want to go to R to kind of introduce to you guys the data set that this thing uses. Um, so the data set that, um, that this, uh, get rid of that one. Uh, so the, da the data set that we use is a data air quality. And this is a very commonly used data set. So the air quality data set um, looks like this when we look at the first 10 rows, right? This is always what I do when I just want to see a piece of the data. I just say from the air quality data set, show me the first 10 rows and that's it. So we see here that we have different things which have been measured. Right, so we have something which is the ozone concentration, the solar radiation, we have the wind, we have the temperature, we have the month and the day. Right, so in this case, we can have what we might be interested in is ozone, right? We might want to kind of predict the ozone concentration in the air based on the other measurements that we have, based on the solar radiation, the wind or the temperature or something like that, right? So we first have to define what is our independent variable and what are the dependent variables. So, and for this data set, um, the uh, the independent variable, um, uh, the, the dependent variable is ozone because that's the thing that we want to predict. We don't want to predict the temperature because that's just something that is caused by by the sun um, or by other factors. We we don't want to predict the wind because like head. So the ozone concentration is the thing that we want to predict. So that's our dependent variable. All the other ones are possibly contributing to the ozone concentration. 
So those are the independent variables, right? We have no influence, more or less, over. Uh, we we could influence those, um, but the ozone concentration is the one that we predict. Right. So when we start linear modeling, the first thing that we want to do is look at if there is anything there. Right. So what we can say is we can say, well, we want to do a linear model and this linear model is we want to predict ozone and we might first think, well, the ozone concentration in the air is caused by the temperature. And then I have to fill in data is right because I have to tell R where to find uh, the ozone column and the temperature column. Right. So I'm just going to say do a linear model of ozone based on the temperature and then I press enter. And then it tells me, oh, this is the uh, formula that you did, right? So this is the formula that you gave me. And then it calculates these coefficients. So these are these beta coefficients, right? So in this case, we have one thing that we want to predict. So when we would look at this in a plot, right? So we can actually do a plot of this as well. So we can say plot air quality uh, dollar ozone versus air quality dollar temperature right so in R we can also use this linear model term right so what we see here is we see the temperature on the x-axis so the thing that we think predicts the uh, ozone concentration and the ozone concentration is on the y-axis right so we just see the measurement points against each other and when you see this you might think yeah there's some kind of a relationship right because when the temperature goes up the air uh, the ozone concentration also goes up so here we get two coefficients, right? So the first coefficient is for temperature that I want to look at, which is 2.429, right? That means that what R tells us that with every degree of temperature increase, you get a 2.4 increase in the ozone concentration. Uh, well, not the concentration, but, but the, the number, right? So it adds 2.4. So if you go from 60 to 61, right, then the ozone concentration goes from, uh, well, around like 10 to 12.4. If I go from 61 to 62, we go from 12.4 to 14 point something, right? So we just had, this is the relationship. Then it gives you this other coefficient right so the other coefficient is called the intercept and the intercept is when the temperature would be zero where would the ozone concentration be so it says that if the temperature would be zero the ozone concentration measurement would be minus 146.995 right and that's where the uh, the x-axis um, uh, that's where the the line the regression line crosses the y-axis at x equals zero and that is because we're having temperature here measured probably in Fahrenheit um, and not in centigrade. So that's why I have 60 degrees is probably around zero degrees Celsius or something. All right. So um, let me switch back to the PowerPoint. So like I showed you guys, what we do is we load the data set air quality using data air quality. Then we put up a linear model and then here I show you the summary. So the summary of the LM, uh, let's go back to R because we only use that the linear model itself, right? But if I would do a summary of the linear model, then it would show me the exact same thing as what I put on the, on the slide, right? And then um, let's go back to the slide. So here again, we see that there's two estimates, one for the intercept and one for the temperature. And then we also get a multiple R squared. So the multiple R squared is a measurement of how good this model fits the data, right? So R squared is kind of variance explained. So that means that this model where we say that the ozone is, is controlled by the temperature explains around 48% of the variance that we see in the ozone. So we still have 52% of the mod or 52% of the variance, which is not explained by the temperature. And there might be another factor which is causing that. Um, but this is the first model that we do. And so we're just interested in like using the LM function, just do a linear model and then see what the estimates are. And then we get an idea of how, um, how, how good our model is. So in this case, our model fits around like 50% of the data we can predict, 50% of the data we can't. 48% we, we can, right? 
So first things first, what we want to do is plot, of course, the regression line, right? So if we go back to our head and we see that we have this thing and now we want to plot the regression line, right? So we want to get the, um, uh, the, the intercept and the temperature into our model, right? So we could just do it basically and say upline, right? Which is the function to draw a line. And then I would say that um, A equals the intercept. Um, so that is minus this number. And then I would say the B, so the directional coefficient of the line, in this case is temperature, which is this. Um, and then it would just add this line to the plot, right? So now we see this line and this line fits pretty well in a way, right? So, so here it's a little bit too low, here the line is a little bit too high and here it's a little bit too low again. Of course, we don't want to just hard code these numbers, right? We want to make a line and we want to make a plot. And in theory, when we do a different model, we want to use the same plotting routine. Um, so what you do in R then is saying that, okay, so hey, instead of, hey, so we plot the ozone versus the temperature, I here add some point sizes and make it blue so that's a little bit more visible. And then I say from the linear model, right? So from this um, uh, linear model that we do, we can just store the whole linear model results into a lm.temp, which is called linear model.temperature. So I just came up with that name, um, but I just store it in a variable. So what I can do is from this linear model that I stored, I can say, give me the coefficients, right? So dollar because it's a list. So from this list, I want to get the coefficients and then I want to get the intercept and I call this A and then I want to get the temperature coefficient and I call this B. And then I say, plot the line, A is A, B is B, make it red, do a line wide of two, right? So that's how I plot a regression line within one of these data sets. Now we want to do the, the confidence interval. And I'm just going to skip this. Um, the, the slides are available for you guys. But calculating the confidence interval is calculating the margin of error, right? Because these beta estimates are not fixed, right? It's not 2.4287, right? That's just a that's just the best guess. It is somewhere with 95% confidence within some confidence interval, right? So hey, the, the beta coefficient might, for example, be 2.38, or it might be 2.56, right? We don't know, but we can calculate the error, right? So we can calculate the confidence interval. And for that, we need two different things. So we need the standard error, which we can get from the summary, and we need to get our critical value. So our critical value is based on the number of degrees of freedom. So this is the n minus k parameter, right? So we're estimating the, uh, the intercept and we're estimating the beta parameter. So that means that we, we lose two degrees of freedom, um, which means that I have to do n, which is the number of observations that I have, minus two. Um, and this is then giving me the critical value. I do the margin of error, which is the critical value times the standard error, which I got from the model. So in our example, it means that I just get the summary. I get the standard error for the temperature measurements, which is uh, 0 0.23. I calculate my critical value, which is just the number of rows in the air quality data set, because those are the number of observations that I have, minus 2, because I'm estimating two betas, one for the temperature, one for the intercept. Um, and then I'm using 0 0.975, uh, which is actually the um, two-sided test, right? So it's 1 minus alpha divided by 2. Our standard alpha is 0 0.5. Actually, no one actually does this. We always use packages for this. But if you really want to, in a single linear regression model, you can very easily calculate your own uh, standard error. You can calculate the critical value and then calculate the margin of error. So in this case, if we multiply these two numbers with each other, we see that the standard or uh, the margin of error is 0 0.46. Right? That means that if I would write this down in a paper, then the, the beta, so the estimated um, and the estimated parameter would run from the estimate minus the, the margin of error to the estimate plus the margin of error. So the real value of the temperature coefficient is somewhere between 1.97 all the way up to 2.89. Generally, we don't really do this. Generally, you can ignore this part here. This is just making a plot of the confidence interval if you want to do it yourself. Uh, normally, you would just use a library. So you would just use uh, visualize re uh, regression, which is VisRec, and then you would just say VisRec, give it the linear model, 
tell it the alpha, give it a, a, a nice name, and then um, give it some of the parameters to make it look pretty. Right, so if you use the, the function visrecht, then this is how the, um, and so here you see the same thing, so you see the regression line, and then in grayish you see more or less the standard error. Here we see the result of me doing it myself, um, but that's just the way that uh, you can do it. But I'm not really interested in explaining you exactly how to do it. But you hey, what you do is you predict your data, then you do the plot, and then you plot the predictions and stuff. Um, but generally, just use the VizRec library to visualize your confidence interval. Good. So the residual, so the error, right? So this is one of the assumptions that you always need to check. Is my model valid? And my model is only valid when the residuals, so the error term, is a normal distribution. Right, so the residuals are the variance left over after fitting your effects. So after I'm fitting my temperature effect, right? And they are a measurement of how well the regression line fits the data. data. So the goodness of fit, right? So we aim to minimize the sum of squares of the residuals. So uh, if we do that, then we do maximum likelihood models. And we, we are just doing maximum likelihood models. So what we want to do is we want to make the residuals as small as possible because as the, the smaller the residuals, the better our model, right? Because the, the predicted values are very much in agreement to the observed values. So how do we visualize the residuals? Well, it's easiest on clean data. So what we do is we first remove all of the uh, measurements where the ozone quality was not measured, so the NAs. So we remove that. Um, so And then we do, of course, our linear model. So what we do is ozone by temperature, just like we did. Then we do a prediction. So we just use the predict function to predict the values based on the model that we have. So here we have ozone is our observed. And here in LM temp clean, uh, we have our predicted values. And then what I do is I just plot the air quality clean temp versus the air quality clean ozone. So I just plot the data. Um, so I plot the observed data and I plot the uh, so I plot the, the the temperature data and on the y axis I plot the ozone. I do the upline so to put the regression line in, and then I'm going to go to each of these air quality clean rows in the matrix and what I'm going to do is just say draw a line where I'm going from the current measurement to the ozone concentration. So how does this look? This looks like this. Right, so what we see here is we see all of the points which we had before, right? And what this little piece of code does, it just draws the blue line. Right, so the blue line is the residual. It is the distance of the, the value that we observe towards the value that we predicted. Right, so at this temperature of uh, 80, we predicted the ozone to be around 60, but we have three measurements, and these three measurements are not exactly this. So linear regression is nothing more than the mathematical procedure in which this regression line is more or less wiggled around to make sure that these, these lines that we see here are minimized, so that the, the, the regression line should be as close to all of these points as possible. Right, so those are called residuals. The code is here, um, the presentation will go online, so hey, you can just look at the code and, and type it in yourself and see what changes. Hey, but you have to realize that here we have two models. So one, hey, first we clean our data set, we do a linear model where we, where we regress the ozone on the temperature, and then using this model we do a prediction. So for each point, for each temperature observed in the model, we do a prediction of the ozone which we could do ourselves as well because we know the intercept and we know the uh, beta coefficient, right? But in the end, the residuals. So what do we want? We want the residuals to be a normal distribution because if the residuals are not a normal distribution, then our data doesn't fit very well, right? And we aim to minimize the distance of the observed points towards the predicted points. So that is single linear regression. That's it. That's the only thing that you do. So you are trying to have, hey, so you have a point of measurements of two variables against each other. And what you're trying to do is draw a straight line through the data. And the straight line through the data is trying to minimize the error um, of, the, of the observed points towards the predicted points. Right? Of course, we have many factors that might influence the amount of ozone. 
right? We don't just have the temperature. We also have the solar radiation. We have the wind, the month, and the day, right? So we can also we we also want to or need to add those influences into our model. When we do that, we start talking about multiple linear regression, right? Because now we're not just doing a single variable and trying to predict the ozone. We're doing two variables or three variables and predicting the ozone. So yeah, mathematically, this looks like this. Yeah? So we have Y, which our, our ozone concentration is our uh, intercept, A, so the alpha. We have beta 1, which is the estimated parameter of the temperature. Here we have just the temperature, which is X1. And then we add plus B2, um, which might, for example, be the wind in our case. The model, if you want to generalize it, it looks like this. Um, but he, when we want to model ozone as a function of temperature and wind, then we get a model which looks like this. So ozone is the intercept plus the temperature times our beta plus our wind times another beta. So how do we do this in R? Well, in R almost nothing changes. We just use the plus symbol to add another explanatory variable. So here we see again, we do a linear model predicting the ozone concentration by fitting the temperature plus the wind from the air quality data set. Then we do the summary and now we see here we get different estimates, right? The intercept has changed, it used to be minus 190. Um, the temperature estimate changed also a little bit, it's now 1.84 instead of 2 point something. And we now also have a beta parameter for the wind. And we see that the multiple R square went up, right? Our model is better because the original model explained 48%, but this model explains 56%, right? So the estimate for temperature changed slightly. First it was 2.43, now it's 1.84, right? So, and this will happen every time. So every time that you add a new variable in the model, this will kind of influence the estimate of the other parameters, right? So again, we can do the same thing. We can plot the observed values versus the estimated values. So here in the uh, in the red, we have the uh, uh, so in the the black points, we see the observed values. In in red, we see the predicted values. And of course, now the predicted values are not a single straight line because for every value that we see here, right? Because I'm only plotting the um, temperature here, but for every temperature, we might now have different wind values. Right? So instead of getting a single line estimate, multiple linear regression gives you multiple estimates for each temperature, right? based on the wind. Sometimes the wind was low, sometimes the wind was high. And again, the same thing holds. We try to minimize the distance of the observed value towards the value which we predicted. So we can also deal with interactions, right? We might think that the, the more the temperature the more the influence of the wind, right? It might not be that the wind is independently doing the ozone concentration. It might not be that the temperature is independently doing the ozone concentration. There might be a relationship between the two, right? If we look at it, it, it seems that there's kind of a curve, right? That, that at higher temperatures, um, the, the ozone concentration seems higher um, than we expect it to be. Right, so and this is called an interaction. So an interaction is nothing more than just saying, well, we have temperature, we have wind, and now we are, are adding a new interaction term, which is the wind multiplied with the temperature, and we're just estimating a new beta parameter for this new variable. Right, so we have the beta 1 for temperature, beta 2 for wind, and now we are estimating a new third interaction beta parameter for this interaction term between wind and temperature, which is just a mathematical multiplication between the two. So in R, when you want to model interactions, you use the double point. So is there any interaction between wind and temperature? So we put up our model. So we say we have a linear model. Ozone is predicted by temperature plus wind plus the temperature interacting with the wind of the data of the air quality. Again, we see that all of our parameters change, which is very logical because we're putting up a new model. And we see that, again, the multiple R squared went up. So this kind of gives us an idea. Here we also see the probability, so we do get a very significant um, effect for the interaction. right? So this gives us the clue that, yes, there might be an interaction. And so when the temperature goes up, um, then the wind might have a bigger effect or a smaller effect. 
So adding the interaction means that our first model explained 48%, the second model where we had wind and temperature explained 56%, and this model explained 62% of the observed variance. Again, the temperature changed again. It was first 1.84, now it's 4.07. And this is because some of the variance will be attributed to the other factors in our model. Okay, so this is just multiple linear regression, right? So we have either a single linear regression putting a single predictor, we can have two predictors, we can have two predictors with an interaction. All of this is called multiple linear regression. We can actually also say well the effect of the temperature might not be a, a, a basic beta right it might not be a single number it might be that at the beginning if the temperature is below like 70 degrees fahrenheit the wind might be uh, the, the if the temperature is between seven uh, below 70 degrees it might be that there is an, an increase right and this increase might be 1.2 but if we look at higher temperatures it might be that the increase is much higher Right, so that we, instead of a single linear line, we have a curve. Right, so linearity of coefficients means that a change in one of the independent variables yields a corresponding change in the response variables. Right, because we are dealing with a model which looks like this. So y equals the intercept plus the beta times the thing that we look at. But the following functions are also linear. Right, because I can do y equals a plus b1 and then I'm taking x squared. Right, so x square now now makes it a, a quadratic function, right? Um, the same thing holds for when I take the exponent, right? If I say y equals a a plus e to the power b one x, that is also a linear function, right? It's just that instead of having x, I'm now having x square, or I am having e to the power of beta one x, right? All of these are linear models, and this is just called quadratic regression. Right, so we're just using the x square model. So how do we fit this x square model? So in our case, we have ozone, which is the intercept plus the first beta times the temperature plus a secondary beta times temperature to the power of two. Right. So in R, we use the square uh, this this uh, square cappy thing for the quadratic regression. However, we need to surround the statement by using the identity function. This is just something that we need to do in R. So if we want to do this quadratic regression model in R, what can we say? Well, we do the LM is the ozone is predicted by the temperature plus the temperature to the power of two. And we need to su surround this by the Y, right? Otherwise it would just multiply to the power of two and just put that in. Um, but so you need to use the identity function here. Again, we get two estimates, right? So we get now an, a negative effect of temperature. So temperature seems to be eh, with increase of temperature. The temperature directly negatively affects the ozone concentration, but there is a slightly positive quadratic term, which means that at, eh, the one will outpace the other one. So it will kind of curve up. Yeah, so this model explains more than the model using only temperature um, because here we can see that the R square now is 0 0.554. If we only use the temperature and not the quadratic term, we were at 0 0.48. Yeah, so the quadratic term is very significant. In your paper, you would write it down like this and say that the ozone is 305.5, which is the intercept. Um, minus 9.6 times the temperature plus 0 0.78 times the temperature to the power of 2. Right? And again, we can just plot the regression coefficients and we can just say, well, okay, so we can say plot the ozone by the temperature using the data air quality. This is just the plot that we made already. And now I can use the curve function to add a line. Right? So I'm just going to add the numbers that I got from my model and then just add it to the plot. And then it seems that, yes, this is a model which fits a lot better than just a single straight line. Um, and here I have my quadratic curve. So that's the way that you do it. You just use the curve function, give it the numbers that you got from the summary, and then you see this really nice curve being plotted. Good. So we already made like a lot of models, right? So we, we now have a whole bunch of hypotheses that we tested kind of, hey, is there temperature influencing the ozone? Is the wind? Is the temperature to the power of two? Hey, which one of these models is really true? And of course, since it is statistics, none of these models are true, right? Because the, the 
basic rule about statistics is all models are false except some are useful right because we're just doing a model and we have no idea if this model is really true yeah, but in the end what we want to find is the model which gives us the simplest explanation which is consistent with the data and this is called Occam's razor so in Latin it is called frusta fit per plura quod potest firi per paucioria and in English this would translate it is futile to do with more things than which can be done with fewer right so scientists always prefer the simplest explanation that is consistent with the data so how do we do this more formally how do we more formally deal with this model selection well we can use something like the Akaki information criterion which is a relative comparison of the models it's not a test it's not a statistical test it's just a guideline right it tells us that this model is to be preferred so it uh, it awards the goodness of fit right so the more you minimize the residuals the better the score of the model but it penalizes for the number of parameters that you put into your model right a model which only includes temperature is of course a model which is worse than when you include temperature plus uh, wind right the question is is does adding wind into the model produce it significantly to kind of have this extra burden of now estimating two of these betas right so the AIC is is a function which kind of does this comparison for you so you just give it two linear models and for each linear model it will give you a value and this value means nothing it's just relative to the other models so the way that the AIC works is you have the AIC is defined as two times k right k here is the number of independent parameters that you estimate going back a couple of slides minus the two natural logarithm of l and l is the maximum value of the likelihood function for the model which is the goodness of fit right you can you can think about this as the sum of or the square sum of squares of all the regression lines right so it's just the the, the when you fit your line through the model head you have unexplained variance um, so l here is kind of a measurement of how good your model fit and then k is the number of estimated parameters in the model which is similar to the n minus k when we talk about the excess of information right so the preferred model is the one with the minimum AIC value however it needs to drop at least 10 AIC points right if if there if you have two models one is minus 100 and the other one is minus 105 you would prefer the minus 100 model because it's not two, 10 points different, right? The, the, you only accept a model as being better if the AIC drops at least 10 points. So in R, we can just use the AIC function. So how do we do that? Well, we load our air quality data, right? We do, for example, three different models. So our first model is the temperature. The second model is the temperature, the wind, and the interaction between temperature and the wind. And then our third model is the model, which is temperature plus the temperature to the power of two. So now what we do is we, we pose these three linear models, and then we ask the AIC function, which model is to be preferred. So you see that the first model takes away three degrees of freedom. The second model takes away five degrees of freedom, the third model four, right? So this is the thing that it penalizes for. And here you see the AIC. So the first model is the worst model. So just saying that it's only the temperature which controls the ozone is not a very good model. The other model, right, has an additional term. It is temperature to the power of two. So the third model has temperature to the power of two in there. And it is better than the first model not that much better because you can see that the drop is around 11 points the best model in this case so the model that we would prefer is the model in the middle where we say that the ozone is determined by the temperature the wind and the interaction between temperature and wind it does give them uh, it does take up most degrees of freedom right because we're fitting the most amount of parameters we're not just fitting temperature we're also fitting temperature wind and the interaction term but still we can see that this model drops significantly at least 10 points from the other model that we are interested in so in our case we would say that we prefer model number two and model number two is the most valid model in our case 
Good. So in conclusion, all models are wrong, some are useful. And this is attributed to George Box. Um, hey, again, hey, extrapolating is something that you shouldn't do from linear models. Linear models are only valid for the measured domain. Um, and this is one of the XKCDs, which kind of explains that, that hey, if you yesterday were not married, today you are married, hey, then of course, in, in a month's time, you would extrapolate um, that you have like 30 husbands, which makes no sense. Good, so that, that was it. Um, so in our case, of course, the model validity goes from around like 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit to like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So this is the domain that we did our measure, or this is the domain of the temperature. So only in this temperature domain is our model valid. Good. You guys made it. Still six people at the end. Like, I think we did a good job today. So are there any questions about modeling? Do you want to show me some, show you guys some more modeling? Do you, are you having questions about linear models? Um, because I think regression is one of the most powerful tools that you can learn on how to build up your models. And I also think it's important for people to see that linear models are not just straight lines, right? A, a, something to the power of two is still a linear model and still very basically fittable um, by the LM function in R. Um, and so R is a very powerful language. We talked about like how you can manipulate your data. We didn't even talk about how to load in your data, right? We, we didn't discuss like the read table or the write table function. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about R uh, during the summer, um, I will be giving a course on how you guys can learn how to program in R. Um, the course from last year is also available on YouTube. Um, let me get you guys the link. I don't know if it's still in chat, but um, there you go. Um, so hey, on YouTube, I have my R programming course from last year. So if you're interested in learning R, um, go to my YouTube and, and look at the R programming course. I, I there's like 50 hours worth of me talking about programming and then it goes much much slower than we did today good so today we talked about some basic r um, we did some very advanced r linear models i think in the r lecture are also like lecture number eight or lecture number nine so they they, they are generally all the way in the back um, so i hope that you guys liked it um, I'm going to stop the recording for YouTube, so YouTube peoples, um, see you in a couple of days with the next lecture.